How's it going, guys? Pound Pete's here watching Pile Gaming, and today we're gonna be doing some spooky stuff. This month, I'm gonna be focusing on more Halloween based stuff, so that's like three videos in the entire month. So, why not start off with what people call one of the most scariest GameCube games of all time? And sadly, it's not Luigi's Mansion. Damn it, I had a whole PowerPoint prepared. One of the scariest GameCube games that we'll be looking at today is Eternal Darkness, Sammy's Requiem. It's most famous for having a sanity meter in the game that not only plays with the sanity of the characters that you play as, but also the sanity of the player. According to Reddit, Personally, I'm not really into horror games, mainly because I get scared easily, but the only GameCube game that I thought was scary was Luigi's Mansion, and I dare you to say that it's not scary. Eternal Darkness was developed by Silicon Knights. Silicon Knights originally planned to have Eternal Darkness be on the Nintendo 64 and have it be released by spring of 2000, but instead switched to the GameCube for development and was released on June 24th, 2002. Silicon Knights actually showcased some beta footage of Eternal Darkness at E3 1999 that would have been on the Nintendo 64. Again, it was just beta footage and nothing more. Eternal Darkness was widely praised, although it wasn't a commercial success. I think that one of the issues was that the GameCube didn't sell that well. I mean, come on, 21.75 million units worldwide? That's nothing compared to how well other consoles sold during this generation. Later, after Eternal Darkness was released, Silicon Knights were planning on doing a sequel for Eternal Darkness, but was cancelled by Nintendo because Nintendo owned the game's trademark. After that, things weren't looking so good for Silicon Knights. In 2004, Silicon Knights ended their games being exclusively for Nintendo consoles and partnered with Microsoft in 2005. They later made a game for the Xbox 360 called Two Human in 2008, but Nintendo still owned the stock of Silicon Knights, so literally nothing changed for them. In 2014, Silicon Knights failed to sue Epic Games, leaving the company to have no choice but to file for bankruptcy. Well, with that out of the way, let's get into Eternal Darkness Sandy's Rapem and see if it is one of the most scariest GameCube games of all time. I'm desperate to know. Starting the game, we play as a young woman named Alex who has a shotgun and she's surrounded by zombies. And for the love of god, I don't know how to shoot this thing. I'd fail if this were on a test. Okay, so none of that was real. It was all a dream. <laughs> well, obviously zombies don't exist, right? Right? She wakes up and gets a call from an officer and tells Alex that there was an accident that happened with her grandfather. She takes a flight over to Rhode Island where her grandfather lives and finds out that he's been brutally murdered. Since the police have yet to get anywhere in the investigation, Alex decides to investigate herself by exploring her grandfather's household. Exploration is key in this game. Anything you can interact with will most likely be important later on. Alright, I found this key that leads to the second floor. Let's see what's... Damn it. After wandering around a bit, playing with this lever thing that doesn't do anything, I found a clock that you have to change the time in order to open a secret door to the secret study room, where we find a big glowing book on a table. Alex begins reading the book, and then we start transferring into the book, and are introduced to another playable character, Piazza... How do you pronounce that? Piazza... Whatever, let's just call him Paul for the time being. Paul and friends have finished another great battle and start heading home until Paul encounters a bunch of tall stones that teleport Paul into an underground dungeon. You have to collect these cubes along your way to open up a locked path, break a statue, fight skeletons, and make your way out. I'm just going to get this out of the way. The combat is... Yeah. I mean, when you first play, you barely know any of the controls, but later on, you get more used to them, and the combat gets more enjoyable. After all of that, Paul touches one of the three artifacts, and then this happens. Now back with Alex. Now you're probably wondering, Pineapple, what's next? Well, that's easy. Just kidding, it's not. You have to grab a piece of paper that's in a photo frame in the study room, then you have to use it, and then the next chapter starts. Cool! We are now introduced to another character named Elia, who is reading the same glowing book Alex has. She reads about the tragedy of Paul, and we find out about a corpse god called Mantrock, then- Oh my god, what, what the heck am I looking at? Looks like a kid's arts and crafts project gone wrong. We also find out that Paul is somewhat alive and travel to a temple to deal with Mantarok. And coincidentally, 
Elia is at that same temple. Objective here is fairly the same thing as the one with Paul, but now with traps and a sanity meter. The sanity meter decreases whenever you see a monster. The lower it gets, the more hallucinations your character will see, and also lower your health. But you can raise the sanity meter up every time you finish an enemy. After a bunch of puzzles, we enter Mantrox's domain. And he kills two random people. They had no purpose except for that. We then see Paul happy and healthy. Sort of. And tells us to leave. W welcome back, Paul. Elia then passes out for some reason, wakes up, and a strange man gives her a corpse heart. The corpse heart possesses her. She falls asleep again, wakes up, does a puzzle to open the door, and then enters it. But then, Paul stops Elia asking where the essence of Mantarok is, and then supposedly kills her. Paul, what did they do to make you like this? Then the chapter ends there. Alright, I know I'm a little early on this, but this game is really good so far, but I really don't think it's that scary though. To me, this game feels more of like a learning history with Alex rather than an eternal darkness. But again, I'm only 40 minutes into the game and my opinion can still change, so let's keep playing. Alex gets another page and the next chapter begins. I'm gonna keep this one short for time's sake. Paul Order is an assassination for some guy called Charlemagnet the Frank, so his plan can move along. I'm just gonna call him Frank. We are now introduced to another character named Anthony. Anthony is given a message to send to Frank. Anthony reads the message and ends up getting cast by a spell that was meant for Frank. Anthony tries to warn Frank that there is an attack on him, but despite his efforts, Anthony was too late and dies from the spell he was casted. Again, it's mostly the same stuff. Solve a short puzzle, fight enemies, move on. But, when playing in this chapter, I got to see more of the effects of losing your sanity. The camera angle is shifted, you walk a lot slower, sometimes when you enter a new area, different things will happen. Either it's more monsters showing up, walking upside down, or even being a different character. And also, your character will be hearing voices in their head. Also, spells are introduced, allowing you to enchant items. Another thing I forgot to mention was that there's a boss in this chapter. I killed it in like 3 seconds. Also, a blue demon comes out of this guy's body. Okay, I wasn't expecting that. We're back with Alex, and with the spells Anthony used, she uses it to fix the broken key to the second floor. After that, it's time to finally head upstairs, and... It's upstairs. Oh look, a statue! Really shouldn't drink this water. We see some guy's ghost, pretty cool, and then we begin the next chapter with another new character. Expect every chapter to have a new character. Our new character is called Kareem, who is a total simp for this woman. I forgot her name, so I'm calling her Ashley. Ashley has had enough of Kareem's simping bullshit and tells him that if he finds a treasure she wants, she'll love him. As a simp would, he accepts this request and tells her not to forget him. He then wanders off to find this treasure and falls for the same trap Paul fell for and falls down an underground dungeon. Also, I like the fact how when something happens like this, the characters are like, yeah, it's cool, whatever. Anyways, if we find the book again, fight some enemies, collect stuff, solve some puzzles, it's literally the same thing as the last chapter. I mean, sure, it's different, but when written on paper, it's literally the same thing as the previous chapters. Also, apparently, it looks like we're in the same place as Paul went, but before he was a total douche. Kareem finds the treasure, being one of the three stones that Paul encountered, and then... So we did all of that for nothing? Ashley tells Kareem that she realized that this stone is not to be possessed, but to be protected. Kareem asks her how she died and this hurt me. Remember when Kareem told Ashley not to forget about him? Yeah, she forgot about him and started going out with this dude and then this dude's wife killed her. Kareem is disappointed at this, which he should be because he literally did all this so he could be in love with her and then she neglects him. Without She said it! She said the thing! She then kisses Kareem and then the chapter ends. Oh, already? Well, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, this part of Eternal Darkness. Part 2 coming soon. This isn't. I swear this game. Well, now that we're here, I feel like just talking about what you do in the game is a little bit tedious because I don't know how many times I've said, oh, it's just like the last chapter, but except there's something new. Because I feel like I, and this is a little bit boring, talking about the same damn thing you do. And plus, I'm only an hour and 20 minutes out of seven hours into the game. 
So in short, I won't be bringing up any gameplay unless if necessary. Once Alex finds the next chapter, we are introduced to one of Alex's ancestors named Maximilian, who has also lived in this household. Then he finds the book. You know, the book. And then bad monsters break in and we have to kill them. After that, Maximilian enters the basement and it's a demon realm. Maximilian intelligently knows that he can't fight all these monsters, so he decides to go find others to help. He was put in an asylum three months later. Well, I mean, at least he tried, but he just didn't know that screaming about a race of aliens in this time period makes it look like you're sort of a bunch of fun dip powder. All right, I think we need to go to the bathroom after that, so let's go into the restroom. Okay, never mind. Problem solved. Once we get the next chapter, we return to the temple in Cambodia where Mantarok lives, but with two new characters, an explorer named Dr. Edwin Lindsay and a collector named Paul Augustine. Wait a minute, something's not right here. 15 seconds later and Paul tries to kill Dr. Lindsay. Obviously Dr. Lindsay is the good guy, so he can't die just yet. And then literally seconds later, Paul Augustine reveals himself as... Paul? Was Paul? I knew there was something wrong here. So anyway, same thing, you fight monsters, collect artifacts, yada yada yada, new mechanic is unlocked, more puzzles, and that's it. It's also fairly similar to the chapter with Elia because this is the same damn place, but now it's in ruins, and there are some different rooms. Oh god, this is just feeling a little bit tedious now. I wish something interesting would happen. What the- <laughs> 